Hi everybody, how's it going? My name is Nick and you are watching Astro Exploring. Today I'm going to show you how to auto guide using Astroberry. This video is going to assume that you have watched my previous two videos, which goes from downloading Astroberry, installing it so that you can log on to it, connect to your home Wi-Fi, and that you've been able to successfully connect to your imaging equipment and that you're familiar with browsing through ECOS and changing the settings to be able to actually take images with your camera. So if you aren't fully aware of how to do that, then make sure you check out my first two videos on this subject, because on this video, we're basically going to dive right in at the point where we have connected to all of our software and we're just wanting to configure it for auto guiding. So the way that I've been auto guiding in Astroberry is to use a piece of software that everybody will be familiar with in astrophotography, which is PHD2. So I'm going to go ahead and load that up. So now that PHD2 is loaded up, we're going to need to create a profile so that we can tell the software what gear we are actually using. PHD2 I find to be quite intuitive, especially for astrophotography software. Um, and we're basically going to iterate through these buttons from left to right until we are guiding. So you can see that all of these buttons are currently grayed out and that's because we need to first connect our equipment before we can then go on to start to loop the exposures. When we're looping the exposures we'll be able to then auto select a start. Once we've auto selected a start we'll then be able to click this button to begin the calibration which will then hopefully allow us to start auto guiding. Right so if we click on the connect button here. You can see that I have already created a profile, uh, but to create a new profile, just click on the manage profile here and hit new using wizard. And at this point, it's going to ask you to select your camera. So I'm using a ZWASI 120. So I would I would click that. If the camera is already connected, which in my case it is, um, then you would go ahead and select, select yes, at which point PHD2 is going to select the camera pixel size automatically. So I'm going to go ahead and click yes. Okay, and it's done that, and I can tell you from um, experience that that is correct because that's the settings that I actually have on my profile. And the guide scope focal length obviously will vary dependent upon which equipment you're using. I'm using the Skywatcher Evo Guide 50mm guide scope, which has a focal length of 242. So we would go ahead and hit 242 in there. That will then calculate the pixel size that it needs to be and click next. Now the mount connection will vary depending upon how you're connecting to your mount. I'm going the old fashioned way still at the moment. I haven't got into pulse guiding yet. I'm going the old fashioned way with the ST4 cable from the back of my guide camera into my mount. And if you're doing the same, then you want to select on camera at that point. And then you want to hit next. And as you can tell here, the ST4 cable won't actually tell the mount which direction it is pointing in, which is why people will always recommend pulse guiding. And I will get into that and make a video about it one day, but that's a separate topic entirely. And so it asks if we want to choose an auxiliary mount connection, but actually you can just leave that blank and hit next. Um, but I'm going to close that here because I've already got my profile loaded up, as you can see here. So this is my ZWO ASI profile. So camera connect mount connect and that's all fine and we can hit close on that and now that we are connected to the equipment we can go ahead and begin looping our exposures so now that we're looping our exposures i've got this set to two seconds you can see that there are stars appearing on the screen and this is quite grayed out there is some cloud passing over at the minute which is uh, really annoying but absolutely typical while i'm trying to film a tutorial about how to auto guide uh, so hopefully the cloud passes in a minute but for now we're looping our exposures and uh, i'll wait for the cloud to pass before um, selecting a star while we're waiting to select a star, if you like this video so far, please do give it a thumbs up and remember to subscribe to the channel and hit the bell notification so that you never miss another upload. And while we wait for the clouds to pass, if you're auto guiding for the first time, now is the time that you'll want to focus your guide cam. We're looping the exposures at two seconds here, which is uh, not a long time, but it's a perfect amount of time just to be able to get the screen refreshing really quickly so that when you're making those adjustments on the focuser, you can see the stars changing shape quite quickly. If you're using the Skywatcher Evo Guide uh, 50 like I am, then I actually found it easier just to slide the guide camera 
in and out rather than actually trying to focus using the guide scope itself. I found that easier, do whatever works for you, but it's really important that you get the best focus you possibly can so that your guiding will work. Right, I'm going to try and start the calibration process, which takes a few minutes. I don't know how well this is going to work because the cloud keeps passing through, um, but I'll do my best and hopefully we will be okay. If you have already gone through the calibration process and, and something has gone wrong or you've lost your star uh, or you've possibly done a meridian flip or something like that and need to restart guiding, if your guiding is being funny, then you can, if I just hover over this here, you can, you can see that you can shift click to force calibration. So once you've gone through the calibration, if it restarts and things aren't quite working properly, if you if you stop and then hold down a shift key on your keyboard and then click it, it will force that calibration to happen, which I have found useful on a couple of occasions. So let's do our best to get this going. The SNR is looking a lot better than it was a minute ago, so I'll do my best and hopefully this will work without the clouds interrupting it too much. So while that's going through the calibration process, which takes a couple of minutes, I just wanted to give you a few tips in order to try and be successful at auto guiding first time, because I know that a lot of people will struggle when they try auto guiding. And it's understandable, auto guiding is quite involved and it's really quite a big step up from just doing a couple of minute exposures with just your camera. So first thing to note, it is really important to have as accurate as a polar alignment as you can. It would be easy to assume that because you're auto guiding your polar alignment doesn't need to be that accurate because PhD2 will send those corrections to the mount and make adjustments on your behalf. While the latter part of that sentence is true, the first part certainly isn't. If you don't have an accurate polar alignment, then the adjustments that PhD2 will be sending to your mount will be way too big for the mount to be able to keep up with. And if the mount can't make those corrections, then your auto guiding won't work and it will tell you the error down here, the calibration process, that the tracking isn't good enough for auto guiding. So it's really important to have polar alignment as accurate as you possibly can. There are of course some things that can uh, help you do that. Pole master is something that comes into, into mind when you are trying to get a really accurate polar alignment. However, that is um, that is quite expensive. I polar align the old fashioned way by just looking through the polar scope and trying to get it as accurate as I possibly can just with my eye. That has worked for me. I've never had a problem with auto guiding. However, I have to bear in mind that I'm only using a three inch refractor with a focal length of 420 mil. So I've got a really wide field of view, which is therefore much more forgiving. If you've got a much longer focal length and that isn't going to be quite as forgiving, which is why I always recommend for beginners to get a wide field telescope because everything is just quite a bit easier. The second tip is that balance is also really important for very similar reasons to the first really. If you haven't got good balance, then of course your mount is working extra hard to be able to track through the sky and if it's working extra hard then it might be working too hard in order for guiding to work or auto guiding will be working much harder than it needs to so getting a good balance is also important and I've already talked about the third tip which is focus focus is just as important for your guide camera as it is for your main imaging camera that should go without saying, but it is really important to spend just that extra bit of time to make sure the focus is as good as it possibly can be. Because if it's not, then again, you're making PhD2 work harder than it needs to. And that's just another potential reason for auto guiding to not work. And the last tip that I want to share with you is really don't don't pay too much attention to the graph. You can see that our guiding is successful. It looks like the cloud has disappeared now. The SNR is an important figure, so make sure you're looking at that. I find that anything around 40 is generally where I seem to hover. That seems to work pretty fine for me, and I've had absolutely no issues there. These figures are also quite important because that's telling you the amount of error, both in right ascension and declination. So these figures are reasonably important. And the graph is also important, but I just wouldn't get hung up too much on, on any of these numbers. If this down here says it's guiding and these crosshairs are green and your SNR is green, then I wouldn't worry about it too much. So you can see that I've actually started my guiding here, but one thing to note is that with guiding comes the possibility of 
dithering. So dithering is a type of noise cancellation and what will happen in between exposures is that the mount will move ever so slightly between frames so that when we get to the stacking process later on, Deep Sky Stacker or if you or, or whatever stacking software you use can identify those hot pixels and remove them in the stacking process. And the result of that is a much, much cleaner image. And you'll hear the term dither or die used in um, online forums in astrophotography. I have to admit, I never fully understood that phrase until I started auto guiding and dithering between frames. And the difference, uh, especially with a noisy DSLR, is really quite phenomenal. And so in order to be able to dither between your frames, you want to go over to the guide tab and then you want to go down here to options and then onto the guide tab here. Scroll down a little bit and you get to your dither section. First of all, you'll want to tick the box that has dither next to it and then you want to select the pixels. Now I did some Googling. This I think depends on the camera that you're using. It was pretty unanimous online that I should be moving three pixels, but you may just want to Google that for your setup because it may be that your setup needs something different. The frequency is how many frames will we take before we dither. And I do, I dither after every frame. So I have it set to one so that it will dither after every single frame. The threshold is the allowable distance before guiding can be considered to be settled. I've got that set to one pixel. Settle is the settle time to allow after dithering has finished. So this is set to three seconds. For me, that doesn't really matter too much because I delay for five seconds between my frames anyway. So there'll actually be an eight second delay between my dithering finishing and my imaging starting. It's just a good amount of time to allow everything to settle down before restarting images. And the timeout is pretty self-explanatory, but essentially after dithering, if it hasn't settled within 45 seconds, then dithering will time out and stop. And if it times out and has to stop, then I have it set to uh, try a maximum of 10 times before just giving up on dithering altogether. Uh, but my dithering has always been totally fine and I've never had an issue with it. So that is all you need to do there. So once you've set that up, just click on OK. And you can see that you can actually look at different graphs uh, and stuff in here. This is a pretty interesting um, plot to look at, I think, if you're if you're sad like me. But really, this is just ECOS talking to PhD2, and you're looking at the same data just on different graphs, basically. So it doesn't really matter which one you look at. And if your PhD2 tab looks something along these lines, then congratulations, you are successfully auto-guiding, which allows you to maximize your exposure time so i've gone on my setup from a maximum of two minutes before i get star trails to now kind of whatever i want it to be um i've been doing five minute exposures recently which has just opened up a whole new world of image quality for me and that's been absolutely fantastic so i can't wait to see my results at the end of this year compared to the end of last year so i hope you found this video useful if you did please do remember to give it a thumbs up remember to subscribe to the channel and hit the bell notifications so that you're notified every time i upload a video my name is nick and you have been watching astra exploring and i'll see you guys next time